What's up, everybody? Welcome in. I'm Anthony Kaz from Kazoto Photo and All Things Beer, and with me today is a very exciting person. This is Ryan Hansen from Big Pop Brewing. What's going on, man? Hey, Anthony. Hey, hey. It's good to drink with you today, buddy. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm excited for this. Uh, we're probably going to get a little buzz on here. Uh, Maybe a little bit. Beautiful. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, so, real quick, before we get into this, this is going to be a beer tasting, appreciation, education seminar with our expert, Ryan. Uh, so, this is going to be awesome. If you got a chance to see the teaser, you know what beers we're drinking, so hopefully you grab some to join us. If you didn't, hit pause, save this video, go read the description, and if you want to follow along, go get those five beers, and we'll see you, you know, when you get back from the beer store. But with that being said, let's get into this. All right, Ryan, let's what do you want to start in. with here? Dude, let's start from the beginning. Like um, most people that get into beer, they are intimidated by beer tap lists or they walk into That's a true. brewery and they're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. That's and true. so my hope is to just say like, hey, it's okay. It's just like the same, the first time you looked at a wine list or a cocktail menu and you didn't know, like, I don't know, do I like gin? Do I like Cabernet? Do Right. Who knows? It just comes with it. Just comes with practice, and so let's uh, let's demystify beer. Let's start from the beginning. I love it. I love it. And I think that's a big part of what you and I both do. You've got Big Pop mm -hmm. Brewing and the consulting. I've got Kazoto Photo, where I'm doing craft beer photography. We're trying to promote craft beer uh, yes. because there's a lot out there. And uh, I know when I first got into beer, probably wasn't my favorite drink. I, I'd say <laughs> for most people, right? It's the yeah. weird combination. But there's a lot to it. So uh, we've got five different styles here. But before we really go into those, what got you into brewing? So I was a Bud Light guy forever. All the way through the Army. To like uh, first five years of our marriage. Like that was, that was all, not you and I marriage, but my wife and I's <laughs> marriage. Yeah. Um, we I, we just met, but <laughs> she just knows, um, like, oh yeah, I just pick up a six pack of Budweiser for the party, and so I was sure. like, okay, well, uh, I was stuck at a Thanksgiving Day uh, party with her cousins, and all of a sudden I realized I'm looking around, all they had in the room was Arrogant Bastard, so the like good old fashioned mm -hmm. <laughs> um, American strong ale, and I'm like. Oh, this is bad. This That's is a tough bad. one to start with. And so I'm like sipping on it throughout the night. I'm like, okay. By the end of the night, I'm in love. And I'm like, my eyes have been opened. And honestly, it's just from reading the back of the can. It's like, you probably won't yeah. like this beer. And I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. knows me. It knows who I am. So <laughs> super long story short, I go from that night and I'm like, okay, I'm open to craft beer. I went to a local craft brewery and I saw them brewing it. I'm like, wait, you guys can make? beer like here in Clovis, California. And they're like, yeah, dude, we make like seven barrels at a time. And I didn't know what a barrel was. And I'm like, right. trying to act cool. So anyway, all of that goes, they kind of showed me the ropes, taught me about the grains, the history of beer. And I fell madly in love. So uh, Christmas comes, I'm like, hey, babe, for Christmas, all I want is like a one gallon brew your own kit. And so I brewed that. It was atrocious. And, and but I was like, hey, no, I can figure this out. I can figure out why why it's gross. So you know, uh, swan dive into YouTube, the forums, uh, all of the things that I can do, the books and everything, and finding local home brewers. And here we are. So now I've been, I've graduated from the Brewing and Distilling Center in uh, not in Knoxville, Tennessee. Beautiful. I've been the head brewer at a ten barrel house brewery for a stint. I teach home brewing. I do these classes live for all of my uh, local breweries. I'm elbows deep in it, um, to, <laughs> including running like pilot batches for big breweries. But my main gig is is brewing consulting for breweries. So this is what I do. This is it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. Yep, I love it. That's awesome. So uh, why don't we go through the five beers that we've got lined up today? I think you and I have two different ones, maybe one different one at the end here. Yeah. But we're definitely starting with the same first three. Exactly. Um, yes. Yeah, so we're going to go through the Modelo Especial, the Lagunitas IPA, and the Arrogant Bastard um, third. And then we're kind of going to veer off. I've got a different stout that I'm going to have, but then 
um, and a different sour. But the concepts Perfect. are going to be so similar that everybody following along is going to be able to track. So, and yeah. One of, the, one of the things I really like about, and we picked these out ahead of time. We kind of discussed mm -hmm. this. One of the things I like about what we did here is I'd say four of these five are fairly polarizing as far as flavor profiles that you've got people saying, yes. oh, I hate IPAs or I love IPAs. I hate stouts or I love stouts. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity for if you're not a lover of that specific type to maybe learn something about it and maybe find the good in it so that when you are at a party and all they've got are IPAs or all they've got are stouts, you can yep. at least enjoy it instead of sitting in the corner weeping. And yeah, boohooing the whole night. So, <laughs> yeah. okay, that's actually a good uh, point for us to start with. So let's let me just briefly overview the ingredients of what makes Love a beer it. because that gives us the the levers that as brewers we can pull to make something that is more unique and um, special than even wine. So wine drinkers hate it when I say that. They're like, oh no, <laughs> like there's some, like blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, as far as, as far as a beverage goes, we have so many more variables on the beer side than we do in wine. So um, it just, it is what it is. That allows us to make different styles. That allows us to tweak different beers, have different mouthfeels and all of that. So I'm going to dive right into that if that's cool with you. I love it. Let's do it. Okay. So, um, beer, we've got four main ingredients. You want me to put you on the spot? What are the, ma what are the main ingredients? Oh, well, water. <laughs> yep. Hops. Yep. Barley. Malt. Yep. Malt. And, um. What turns wort into beer. Yeast. Yeast. There you go. You got Thank it. Thank you. So we got four. Um, water, malt, hops, and yeast. So those are the four basic ingredients. Of course, nowadays we have fruity pebbles, we have sure. gummy worms, we have whatever you want to put into your but beer. Every, everything's built off of those four Somebody's buildings. Somebody's put a Cinnabon in their mash tun, <laughs> and it just is what it is. So but the four main requirements, um, otherwise you're looking at, is it a groot where you're using spices instead of hops and blah, blah, blah. But sure. four main ingredients. Um, the barley is the number one lever that we get to pull. So we have two row, we have six row, we have Maris Otter, is it Vienna malt? Is it basic American light pale two row? Is it Viking Pilsner malt? Like all of the different maltsters throughout the world grow these grains and they kind of treat them in the same way throughout the world, there's different ways of malting the malting process. Sure. So you basically steep it in water until it starts to grow. That unlocks its enzymatic power. Then you kiln it. Um, so you're toasting it to a certain level. The more we toast it, the darker it is. So a chocolate malt is probably the same two row that you're using as your base malt, but it's also been toasted until it's dark like coffee. So okay. that's how we get those toasty, roasty malt numbers. Um, Caramel 20 is lighter than caramel 60, obviously. And so that's where we're playing with the colors of things. So uh, there's that. There are hundreds of varieties of hops sure. as well. So hops are another big element. And we get to decide as brewers when and how much to add them throughout the brewing process. You can put them into the mash. You can put them into first wort before it gets up to a boil. You can put it in at the boil, at the end of the boil, anytime in between depending on when you add it, changes how it uh, affects the final beer. And so um, those are just some of some of the variables that we get to pull. And then obviously a yeast, we could get into a, like a London Fog yeast, which is going to make it kind of a cloudy, uh, sure. say if we're going for Hefeweizen or something like that, or a super crispy, uh, crispy boy is going to be its own like super simple Chico strain of yeast. So we have so many variables to play with. That's why I'm excited about these because every single one of these is made from the exact same four ingredients. They're just used differently. Yeah, so yeah. I'm ready when you are. I'm getting kind of getting thirsty here. Yes. Oh, I'm definitely getting thirsty. Uh, you know, I talk a lot and that generally lends to being thirsty. So yep. a lot. So we're going to start with the Modelo Especial. Um, so... A lot of the brewing process, you'd say, is kind of this blend between chemistry and art, right? 
it is a total amalgamation of art versus science. The, the process itself is pretty straightforward. As long as you understand that, that gives you the leeway to really play with those variables and decide as a brewer when to do it. It's exactly like cooking, right? Um, if I know there's a certain bitterness that I want to hit, I'm going to make that recipe and pretend exactly like if you're making a pasta and your grandma's recipe says, add salt, but it doesn't say how much salt. You just add it until you, the ancestors whisper into your ears, yeah. that's enough. <laughs> grandma, so, grandma knows yeah. best. I'm not going to question her. Grandma knows best. Yep. Okay. So for this, are you ready? I'm, My good I'm sir. ready. We so, are staring at the exact same beer, which is gorgeous. Look at that. It is. It's crystal clear. That's exactly what beer is supposed to look like. Um, so you can actually get see it. my face through this if you're looking I was just at my camera. Say, yeah. Yeah. There I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to go through the basic steps of, a, of a, exactly like a wine tasting. So we're going to go through the appearance, the aroma. Uh, we're going to talk about the flavor, the mouthfeel and then our overall impressions of them. So that's kind of the gist of a general tasting for anything, whether it's wine or spirits or uh, beer. So I want to help folks get some descriptive words to talk about each phase of those. So we've all heard it. Somebody on Untapped is like at a restaurant, and they're like, oh, this stout is good. Like, that doesn't tell me yeah, yeah. anything about that stout, right? Um, or even worse, I'm an IPA guy. This Pilsner is garbage. It's like, why did you order an IPA? Like, what's the matter? Right. <laughs> You're judging something that <laughs> you admit you don't Pilsner. love. Right. Yeah. So let's try and add some words to that. So we're going to go through. We've got the downloadable beer evaluation guide um, for this. So you can either go to bigpopbrewing.com and find that. Uh, message me or Anthony and, and like, I'll throw we'll it on you, my site we'll as well. We'll get you the document. So We'll have it for you. Um, we're just going to go through some basics here. Yep. So the appearance, let's talk about it. What do you think? Uh, well, again, we've got this nice light kind of gold color. It's not a uh, cloudy. It's very clear. Yep. Um, I don't have a whole lot of carbonation going on in mine. I mean, there's a little bit, but not a ton. Mine does. I have a nucleated glass though. That's intended to do okay. that though. So, okay. um, not not a not a flex or anything. It's just it's made to just like a champagne glass. Yeah, it's yeah. got nucleation spots for it to to rise up from the center. So and we'll talk um, about glasses in a minute. Yes, we'll we'll nerd out on that. Um, yeah, this color this is this is a it's a gold um, like kind of it's darker than pale straw. So if you were yep. looking at like a Bud Light, you're looking at pale straw. So this is uh, gold perfectly crystal clear some of the other descriptors that we might use when looking at the appearance is we so obviously the color so we have we could have is it black is it dark brown is it copper so this is kind of a, a gold copper yeah not even copper we're, we're gold we're golden here yeah I, i'd go um, more golden yeah and then you could go all the way to like pale straw or yeah yeah Clear, clear. Like if if you got a super light um, beer that just kind of has just basically no color, which also probably means it has no flavor either. So we don't really want to drink those. It's a good point. Um, clarity. Uh, this is crystal. That's yeah. that's the word that we would use for this. It's crystal clear. Uh, alternates could be cloudy, dull, bright, opaque. Um, a stout, for example, a, a good stout, as we'll see later, is going to have like a tinge of uh, red around the around mm. the edges. If you hold it up to the sun, you're like, oh, dude, that's like a ruby red color, which most people don't don't seem to don't don't associate because you're looking at the glass and it just looks black. It's like, no, that beer is actually sure. clear um, and you can see it on the edges. So that's always fun. Um, the head on this is also part of the appearance analysis. Um, this is not holding a very good head, which no, is it normal. pretty quick. Yep. And so like pour straight into the glass. It makes just a little bit of foam, but it doesn't linger. It's not putting lacing down the glasses. And that's just because a normal, a light international lager, which is, the, uh, so this is a pale international lager. Um, 
doesn't have tons of protein in it. So foam is just a colloidal mesh of protein uh, that's trapping CO2 that's coming out. And that's what coats the sides of the glasses. That's what makes foam. So foam is just more beer. It's just in a different form. It's got trapped and, CO2. And in. you use the term lacing there. So for mm -hmm. the novices, explain lacing a little more in depth there. So as you drink a pint down, and we're going to see this with the Arrogant Bastard. Mm -hmm. um, on the inside of the glass, there's going to be, it looks like kind of like fishnet stockings. So we're going uh, burlesque here. Um, it's going to coat the inside of the glass. That is beer protein gluing itself to the side of the glass. That's a good thing in my mind. Um, most beers have it. This one will not. As a pale lager, it does not care about that. It just wants to be crushable on the golf course. So um, let's dive into it. That And so, again, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, right. whether it does or doesn't. But... Uh, I think it's a, it, it's a good sign for a craft beer to have lacing. It is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. oh, give it a sniff. So, lagers. What makes a lager a lager is the kind of yeast that is used to brew it. So they say a lager is a bottom fermenting yeast. It's traditionally done at lower temperatures. We at Brewlosophy have debunked that. Like, it just certain yeast strains like certain temperatures. So we're talking like 55 degrees versus 68 degrees to ferment it. So nerdy, nerd, nerd stuff. Sure. Um, <laughs> but the moral of the story is it has a distinct flavor and it's just because of the kind of yeast that it is. Um, it generally takes longer to make. It will make a crystal clear, happy beer and lager. The word just means to store and traditionally they're stored cold so cold and time is what clears a beer up um they have a kind of a fruity note mm -hmm. that an ale wouldn't otherwise have so as you're smelling this um some of the words that come to mind would be fruity and i know this doesn't uh, estery, so a, a beer's esters, that's the byproduct, is one of the byproducts of yeast consuming sugar is um, the aromas that come off of it. We call those esters. And so it's very, this is a very, very clear example of uh, a lager yeast. So um, okay. you might get banana smells coming off mm -hmm. of a hefeweizen for example or clove right um and and so it this is but really a lager it's like supposed to be a very clean profile so there's not much on the nose definitely yeah. no hops on this I'm, either i'm getting this kind of fruity citrusy floral type scent coming off of it on the nose floral's there. a perfect word for it yep all right going for a sip That's good. What do you it's think? It's good after a long day, too. Um, it is after a long day, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's three hours later for me. So, uh, very clean. It's crisp. Um, it, it kind of tastes the way it looks. Uh, it's got this very clear profile. It has this very clean flavor to it. It's not something that's really layering on too much. So, I think it's yeah. like you said, this is a golf course type beer. <laughs> Or it's hanging a chuggable. The beach type of beer and just <laughs> yep. drinking them down. Um, yeah, you, it's very easy to just keep drinking this. Yes. Hence why they sell it in the gigantic can and uh, you can get it anywhere because it's a crowd pleaser. Everybody loves it. It's fair. Yeah. See, I got the stubby little bottle guy. The the trajectory of beer nerds usually ends up like, oh, okay, I'm Budweiser, I'm Budweiser. Full scent, barley wine. I want the hardest, highest ABV thing that I can find. And give me so many IBUs in my IPA, my beard will grow faster. And then we kind of just like, oh, a red ale's really good. Oh, these ambers are mm -hmm. nice. Why don't more people? Oh, the crispy boys. Yeah. Like, this is what we're yeah. drinking when we brew, for example. <laughs> like, I'm not sipping on a 9.5% IPA. Right. So... You're not going to get anything done for the rest of the day. <laughs> Correct. I need a nap. Um, okay. So the flavors on this with the malts, this is where the malt bill comes through. So um, there's a, there's kind of a crackers 
or a, a white bread flavor mm-hmm. that comes through for me. Yeah. Um, Not so much biscuity. Some alternates for this would be, like, if you're drinking a stout, we're going to taste some chocolate notes. Um, Caramel might be in there. That's not this beer, but um, I'm just, like, overall, that's what we're looking at. And then from the yeast, which is a big factor in the beer, uh, like we talked about, you might get uh, fruity or uh, tart flavors. There might be a warming sensation in your mouth that comes from the yeast. Um buttery perhaps this one this one has like a it's crisp when it's in your mouth and then it just dissipates it's gone like and and i know we're kind of encroaching on the mouthfeel side here but it it goes away what that does is it makes you want to take another sip so you're constantly wanting to like put it like (laughs) put it back in your mouth (laughs) been trying not to jump the gun onto the mouthfeel Mm -hmm. side so, um, very little hop character on this. Um, I, I believe Modelo uses just a general noble hop. Um, so that would be like a, uh, Nelson, um, something that's like, doesn't impart a lot of bitterness. It just has enough hop aroma to balance out that, uh, the, okay. the malt bill. So this is a very straightforward beer. Obviously everybody has it. And so easy peasy. Um, Again, the hops, it could be an herbal, it could be floral, it could be uh, citrusy or grassy or piney. Those are the words that we would use to describe it. My favorite piece of advice to give to somebody is like, tell me what it reminds you of. And I'll yeah. like when we're drinking an IPA, I can tell you immediately, like this is walking through Yosemite and smelling the pine trees. That's what I get on the aroma. That's all the hops. Right. And that's okay. like just a brain memory that I have. Or it could be um, this is the crust on a creme brulee when you're talking about the malts and you're like, yes, that's it. It's like a like a burnt sugar yeah, flavor. Yeah. Like, um, again, there's no wrong answers. We're just trying to put words to the flavors. So and, and let's I keep think going. that's a big part of it, right? Just there's no wrong answer. So what you're tasting and what I'm tasting mm-hmm. might be slightly different and what you at home are tasting could be completely off from what we're saying. You're not wrong. It's just yes. a different flavor profile and we're all going to associate things a little differently. And I just want people to be thoughtful about what they're tasting. And that's it. Yeah. So yeah. I, um adding vocabulary to it really, really helps. Yeah, yeah. I've I've had a couple people on, you know, different videos. Uh, they go, "It's beer. I just drink it." I'm like, "Yeah, like that's fine. If you just want to go get smashed, that's great." But yeah. we're trying to taste it a little bit. We're trying to educate here. That's yeah. what we're here for. I like giving credit to the brewers that made it. I mean, somebody yeah, out right. there spent hours and a hours lot and of a time. lot of money and and time learning how to do this. So, so it's kind of like a homage to the to the artists. So. It's good. It's really good. Okay. Uh, Mouthfeel. This is a really easy one. Everybody drinking or everybody who's had a Modelo knows this is, um, it's crispy. It just, it's perfectly carbonated. This 2.8 volumes of CO2. um, It dissolved into it. It's just, it's like that perfect middle line. It's not too spritzy. It's not under carbonated. These folks know what they're doing because it's mega beer. Um, other words that we might use would be uh, creamy, uh, vivacious, which I know is fun, but that's like a like a champagne yeah. is like vivacious, like it like yeah. it's, it's like happy in your mouth. Um, or you could go on the other end, like a barley wine would be. Um, this is it's not usually a word associated to a barley wine, but when it comes to the carbonation, it's delicate. It's just enough to where it spices up the drink, but it's still kind of viscous. Um, or prickly would be uh, oh, when, I, like when I get into my sour, for example, prickly is is the word because yeah. it's super, it's very highly carbonated. And so, um, and then we can talk about the sensation, right? Smooth, uh, viscous, silky, uh, puckering, um, warming that comes mm. to mind. So it just depends on the style. This um, balanced. Yeah. Happy, crushable. <laughs> like those are the words crushable that come off. Crushable is definitely one I would use. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, 
a little bit dry just because it goes away fast. And then a fruity is is definitely there because that's kind of the aroma that lingers in the back of my mouth. But it definitely wants you to have more. It's not syrupy. It's not uh, bitter. None of those no. things apply to this. It's just super crushable. It's kind of yeah, like, it, um, uh, again, that's why we started with this it, one. It's not bitter. Um, that's something that has always rubbed me slightly wrong, and I'm trying to work <laughs> on that a little bit. But the the carbonation is there in my mouth, but it does kind of fade away. It almost like yes. It, to me, it's almost uh, that cotton candy sensation where you put the cotton candy in your mouth, yes. not from a flavor profile, but it just yeah. dissipates and disappears. That's kind of what happens here. Yeah. Yep. And that's the by design. That's why everybody loves it. That's why it's everywhere that you can find beer. So, um, yeah, no issues at all. You're pounding the whole pint. I'm calling it <laughs> now because uh, we got some heavy hitters coming up. We do. We do. Um, so with that being um, said, I've got a question yeah. for you as we go through this for other people who are doing a tasting, whether it's along with us or going out to uh, their local craft brewery, do you mm -hmm. have a tip for them on – Anything they should do from moving from beer to beer. Sure. Um, when it comes to flavor, uh, water, regular water is like pH of seven. Take a sip of it. Like it's gotcha. just the best way to clean your palate and that. When it comes to aroma, even if you have a, 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 a flight in front of you and you're trying to like go from one to the other and you don't like want to sit there and have water or like salty uh, crackers are a common go-to when you're evaluating beers and doing judging panels. Um, honestly, something neutral, like smelling your skin. Like, hmm. I know it sounds so just weird. just kind of have in your hand here and just... It just... Okay. Yep. Um, and then on that note, a word of caution, if you are going to go in and you're going to do a beer evaluation, you want to stay away from perfumes, uh, heavy deodorant flavor or smells, um, flavors, <laughs> um, uh, smoking. Like if you're going to have a cigar, just have it after your beer tasting appreciation. Like, cause those, all of those things are going to affect the area, especially if you're on a panel with other people, like you don't want to interfere with their ability to smell sure. and taste the beer. So, yeah. No, so that's a nothing good that could contaminate the senses there. Just yeah. wait till afterwards. Kind of stick to bland, normal stuff. Yep. If, if they're like a proper BJCP judging panel for a, like a sensory analysis or a competition, if somebody walks in that has a bunch of perfume, they'll ask them to leave. They're like, no, nope, huh. you can't be here. Yep. Interesting. Because um, it, it, it affects so much. Imagine like a lavender scent or something yeah. affecting your IPA. Then you're like, I don't, there's no freaking lavender in this. Right. Um, so. Uh, All right. So now we're going to move on to the IPA, right? We're going to move on to the IPA. So normally I would say pick something like a pale ale or... Uh, something a little bit more drinkable, but I really wanted to lean into the flavors and IPA is so popular right now that like, we just got to go for it. And so in my opinion, Lagunitas IPA, the only thing that's better than this is the little something, which is also okay. Lagunitas. And it's just, it's such a fantastic beer. So we're going to get into it. These are not too bitter for a while there. <laughs> Folks were like, how many IBUs can we pack into this? But IP is kind of balanced out. And in my opinion, this is a perfect example. So I'm going to get a bottle opener. And be right yeah. And with that being said, I mean, like you just said, even on the label here, they have highly balanced, super drinkable. Yes. We're at 6.2 on the IBUs. Now, IPA is one of those beers I mentioned earlier I know can be a little more polarizing. Yeah. If you've got somebody out there watching who is just kind of getting into IPAs, they're trying to figure out where to start, there's 24 different varieties of IPAs. What's a good yes. one for them to kind of gateway themselves into it? 
Um, traditional East Coast IPA is going to be the most balanced. If you want to go West Coast, you're talking more piney, bitter. Um, so say like Pliny the Younger is a good example of a West Coast. Um, Grapefruit Sculpin from Ballast Point is that's a good one. Hundred percent on my top five and will never leave. And so that has like basic grapefruit adjuncts, but their sculpin line in general is like a perfect go-to to get started with IPAs. So it, it, it's actually fun. I'm not, don't mean to cut you off. That's yeah, no, go funny. For you mentioned that one. That is the one that got me willing to try other IPAs. Okay. I've got something for fun for you here. From Ballast Point, I was here. I'm digging around under my bar right here. Um, one of the oh, brewers beautiful. gave me that tap handle right off of the bar. He's like, oh, that's oh, your that's favorite awesome. beer? Here you go, buddy. And he like took it off. I was in San Diego. And I was like, dude, this is like oh, that's awesome. such an amazing souvenir. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's, I, a, I, it's like cracked. It's obviously like poured 400 Oh, that's awesome. And, um, it's one of my favorite souvenirs. Yep. Yeah. For for years, I just could not get into them. They, because of, you know, like you said, mm-hmm. there's pack and IBUs into certain ones. It wasn't the flavor profile I loved. And yeah. I came across that one. I think I picked it up because the can was cool and I wanted to do a photo shoot yep. of it. And I cracked it open. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe oh. I do like certain IPAs. And It doesn't taste uh, like fish. Uh, yeah. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's an important thing for anybody out there who's, you know, working on it. Experiment, right? Yes. Try different exactly. things and you're bound to find something you like or you know that's mm-hmm. not a style you like at all after trying ten of them. It's- the way that I equate this to somebody that's new to craft beer is, look, when you were a kid, you did not like um, black coffee, for example. Or sushi. Or sushi or like and, and like extreme flavors just right. weren't super awesome for you. Right. Well, over time, like you, you may have gotten used to or wanted to do more of X, Y, Z, and you just kind of like start getting into it and you're like, oh, all right. And so IPA is kind of one of those extremes. Like that's the black yeah. coffee of beer um, when, when, you, when it comes to bitterness. And so that's not a good yeah. thing or a bad thing. It just is what it is. And so if you don't like it, it's fine. Hopefully today we're going to analyze this and you're going to see some flavors and uh, some of the elements that come out of this that are not just, oh, I don't like hoppy beer. So um, let's get right into it. Yeah. Appearance? What do you think? So it's a little cloudier than the last one. It's not quite as crystal clear, mm-hmm. but it's still fairly clear. I yeah. can still see through it. I can still see you on my monitor, but yep. I can't make out everything about you, right? Yep. It's that's that's darn clear. But there's a lot more going on, like calorie yep. protein wise and all of that stuff than there was in the last one. So that's and that's normal. This is a this is a perfectly clear IPA. Like you see my logo through it. Like yep. that's that's happy. Okay. And then um, got a, a bigger head, a foamier head, it didn't dissipate yep. as quickly. So let's show the folks what that looks like. Nice fluffy. Yeah, I mean, you can see so it comes up. There you got some cream on there. The color of the head is um, like perfectly white. Yep. Maybe just a tinge yep. of yellow on it. That's normal. Yep. All right, going for the aroma. We're going to plow through the next ones a little bit faster um, just for the sake of time. But sure. um, tell me, what, what do you smell on there? So I get a little bit of orange. Ooh, I'm getting yes. there, so I'm getting that little bit of citrusy, that little bit of orange specifically, mm-hmm. or maybe even a little grapefruit, something of that nature there. So in the citrusy realm, I'm getting like yeah. citrus rind, like like yeah. when you when you peel, peel the citrus yep. rind and you put it on the the edge of the glass. That's that's yep. definitely what I get. Yep. Are we having old fashions later in Manhattan's? Ooh, yeah, <laughs> old fashioned for days. Angels envy, come to Papa. Yep. Fair enough. Okay. Um, the yeast is not giving off like a huge, um, it's not giving off a lot of character from the yeast. So this is a straightforward, uh, probably Chico strain, normal yeast. Um, but the hops, talk to me about the hops, Anthony. 
Yeah, I'm still getting. I'm getting that floral citrus, kind of yep. like what we had, similar to what we had last time, but different. At the same time, it's stronger. It's it's got yes. more pop to it. Um, so I can tell it's going to have more flavor than the Modelo that we just had. This a is, different flavor, it, I should say. It's citrus for days on this yep. one. You're spot on. Talk to me, Goose. <laughs> it's it's good. It, so when they say on the bottle there, it's balanced, it's balanced. You're not getting hit over the head with the hoppy bitterness. Mm -hmm. I think that fruity, citrusy flavors coming through. I'm almost getting a little pineapple. Um, okay. It, yep. Just kind of coming through underneath there. But I still say it would be... More of the RNG citrus grapefruit type flavors, more than yes that. When we talk about balance, this is the epitome of balance in my mind. So yeah. we have we've got the maltiness. So there is just a little bit of like a caramely uh, element from the malt. Yeah, um, bready a little bit, but it's a hundred percent balanced and happy with. The citrusy, a little bit of pine resin on the malt, a little bit, or on the on the uh, on the hops, but it's not like kapow. It's it's just present, it, and all of the gin. flavors. Do, yes, it, okay, that perfect example. Yeah, that's the extreme edge of bitterness. Right. Okay, um, and that's from the the coriander and the juniper and all of those things. Um, you can definitely have those flavors in beer. This does not have that. It's uh, this is like. Piney citrusy combo just balanced perfectly with a kind of a bready, caramely malt bill. This is so well rounded. That's why this IPA, for somebody trying to get into and learn IPAs, is the perfect gateway drug. Yeah. Don't go full send and, uh, you know, hop into a, like a dark West Coast IPA that's 9% ABV. Like, no, 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 that, no, no. Was that a pun there? Hop into? <laughs> hop into <laughs> yes meant to do that <laughs> um no this is the and this is super approachable and easy to drink and anybody that wants to do that i think they should start here yeah i i yep. can agree with that so now mouthfeel mouthfeel um kind of the same as the modello this is just kind of middle of the road um it is it is it lingers a little bit longer exactly than the last Exactly what I was going to yep. say. Mm -hmm. That's exactly um, what I was going to say. It hangs on just a little bit longer there. And that's a function of the bitterness of the hops. Like that's just like the flavor is going to linger longer. Um, it's It doesn't have anything off on the mouthfeel. So there's no like uh, – creaminess or viscosity to note it's just it's there it's crispy this is a fantastic beer so that's yeah that's i can all agree there, with that. all there is to it so uh, again and that and that's like on the the fifth category that we didn't really talk about on the last one is the impressions and so we have drinkability is it heavy yeah. is it refreshing um light is it filling um intense so talking of intense you ready for the arrogant bastard? I am ready for the arrogant bastard. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> right, so, so, so as we're, we're moving there, as we're, as we're cracking these open, uh, I wanted to ask you this. So as we go through, people will notice I'm using a different style of glass for each beer. Yep. A lot of people are basically only used to the regular pint glass that you know you find at every bar ever. So yes. in your opinion, like that one. Peep, that's, yeah, that's my that's my Bubba Gump shrimp coat. Yep. Yeah, I've, <laughs> that's funny. I've got a half of ice in glass that's Bubba Gump shrimp coat. Hey, there but you go. If you were to advise the new drinker who may not want to go and buy the glass for every style of beer, mm -hmm. what would be the one glass that they should gravitate towards that's not the pint glass? Because everybody, everybody's got pint glasses. Everybody's got pint glasses. Yeah, they actually became popular because they, that's they started as shaker 
like there's shaker right. pints, like to put the metal cap on at a bar. And so you can kind of see what's going on inside. Um, they last forever when I'm doing brewing consulting and I'm telling a new brewery what to buy when they first open. That's what I tell them to get because these are going to last for 10,000 washes and it, it, they can fall on the floor and sometimes just bounce around and they don't even break. Um, glassware. Some folks get really snobby about it. I like the nonic pint. Okay. Some people pronounce that it's the nonic or nonic, but I technically nonic. it's got this like bump right here. So if it falls onto its side, it's not going to nick the glass. That's kind of how it got its name or that's what the story is anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but the nonic pint is kind of a catch all. I like it because if I'm filling it and say it's the first pour off of the taps, the foam kind of like constricts itself right at that bump. And so it like pulls together so it won't overflow as easily. It's It's got like that, the bump right there to hold it. So it's not going to slip out of your hand when you're tipsy or if your hand is wet or whatever. I just, this is kind of just a good catch all. But that being said, this, uh, like a, a tulip style glass is perfect for anything that's higher ABV or full flavor. So Belgian beer, okay. Um, anything that you really want to like condense, like the aromas are, are condensing in there. So when you really go in and you can smell it, that like emphasizes it. But I just have a bunch of nautic pints, um, <laughs> in my brewery. So, uh, I go through so much, like people kick them over by my fireplace and just sweep it up and buy another six pack of them. So they're a good catch all for every style. And so you still get to be like a beer nerd without yeah. being too nerdy. Yep. And for anybody who's watching at home, if you're curious about some different styles, uh, towards the end here of this video, I'll put some uh, links to a whole little short series on to basically just introducing you to different glasses because there's a lot out there. There is yep. a lot out there. It's beautiful. Yep. So, case in point with the Nonic, uh, you can kind of get used to how these glasses pour. And so, like the first third, Pour it down the side, then you start right down the middle. It, it allows all of this foam to express itself in the glass, and it, it has a hard time overflowing just because of that bubble. So, um, yeah, uh, nerdy nerd beer glass stuff. Um, also, if people want to dig it, um, there there's a, a Brewlosophy podcast episode that we did that's entirely on glassware. It's an hour and a half of super beer nerds talking about glassware all the different kinds they did mess up and we forgot to mention i say we i wasn't even on it um we didn't <laughs> mention the sam adams uh glass which mm. is the iconic uh craft beer glass but yeah. everything else in there is is good we i love these i don't even know what they're called but they're kind of a combination of a tulip and yeah. whatever but these are my sample glasses so anybody doing a beer sampling like these are excellent Probably so gonna get just look like for that. it kind of like i don't want to say hourglass i don't know what to call it it's just it's like a it footed is. tulip it is a footed tulip yeah <laughs> so but those are excellent um i i am not super nerdy about that i kind of don't care yeah fair yeah. enough yeah all right so let's do it you tell me you run through right. this one let's go through yeah, this yeah. one kind of quick yeah. All right, so I'm getting this dark kind of rouge color to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not crystal clear, obviously, but you can see through it. You know, yep. It's not cloudy. It's just a darker color. But I'm, let me see if I can get it. What color is it? Uh, it's kind of this red amber. Is... There. So I'm going to hold this up here. I'm so putting a flashlight behind a... it. Yeah, that's why I just threw, threw my light up behind it yep. for everybody who's at home. So you've got this reddish color here, which is super pleasant. The head is very foamy. It's holding really nice. It's fluffy. Yep. It's like a cloud. <laughs> um, so it doesn't dissipate as quickly as the last two. Um, no, it's pleasant. The, the head is also not the same pure white as... The previous two it's got Dude, a little bit spot on creamier color on it 
Yeah. I just painted some rooms in my house, so I'm kind of on this color. No, thing. you're good. There's like <laughs> 17 shades of white that you get to pick from. Yeah. So, uh, dude, I, I completely agree. You're spot on. Um, we're talking about a – this is a kind of a ruby red – uh, flavor going on. So the style of an arrogant bastard is, uh, it's called an American strong ale. It's a, I, like if I had to equate it, it's like a hoppy red. So if you have an amber ale or a red ale that has high bitterness, this is what that is, but it's its own style. So, um, let's dive right in the aroma. I'm getting biscuity for sure. Mm -hmm. Got a little bit of nutty. Yeah. And sweetness. And there's sweetness was, to it too. Yeah. I was going to say, I almost have this muddled cherries type smell there. Mm, interesting. Yeah. because And I think that's where the sweetness to me is coming from. Yep. I'm not getting cherries. That's usually a flavor like cherries or, or uh, stone fruit will come from, well, stone, not stone fruit, uh, pit fruit, so like cherries or plums yeah. or something like that, will come into play from the malts that are in like a barley wine or something darker like that. So um, this, yeah, uh, it that's that's definitely got that sweetness. No coffee notes. No, no. Uh, like this is just malty, sweet, yeah, kind of biscuity, and then yeah, I, I get that fruity note. I, I totally get There's that. There's something out. there. I just I'm not sure what it is. I I'm associating yep. cherry. I think that's coming from the yeast, uh, the yep. yeast's expression in it. Yep. And so, but uh, the hops, I can. Th there's def There's a little bit of citrus in there. A little bit, yeah. And I kind of want to go in for a taste. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Totally different from the aroma. Yeah. This, if you're simply smelling it, and then you go in for a sip, it's like, boop. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Let's do it. Which I love about this beer so much. Um, American Strong Ale is definitely supposed to be something that, as they say on the back of the can, you probably won't like this beer. Um, <laughs> it's, that's excellent. Um, yeah, because that's we go from like a fruity, almost citrusy nose with with caramel on on the nose that sweetness to bitter dank like almost weed type bitterness almost like, mm, so I, good i, oh, I get so that good. on the app like yeah. as it lingers and mm -hmm. dissipates i get that dankness more than right on the tongue but yep. yeah oh it's definitely there makes me want to cough <laughs> yeah <laughs> We don't know what we're talking about. That's a... Mm. <laughs> Never a day in the life. <laughs> yep. That's a um, different show. <laughs> so this is an excellent beer. I would not recommend you starting your craft beer experience with an arrogant bastard. That is how I got my start. And it was a swan dive into the deep end that um, <laughs> ended up well. But it took me a minute to recover from this. So um, you're good. Here, check this out. We talked about lacing earlier. This is what lacing is. Yeah. See how it's like coating the inside of the glass and it's just lingering there? That won't go away. It'll sit on my counter waiting to be washed for 12 hours and that won't go away. That actually just like builds up and firms up. So that's, that's what lacing wild. is. If somebody talks about it, um, again, these are the proteins that are in there kind of creating kind of a fishnet that catches – the CO2 that's coming out of suspension and which is a good thing because that CO2, then when those little bubbles pop out of that, that's where you get aroma out of it. So, sure. um, this is good and, uh, high protein beers because this has a boatload of calories and, um, just stuff from the mash bill that's in it, um, is going to create that protein, those colloidal mesh uh, networks and so again foam is just more beer it's mm -hmm. it is what it is if you just let that set and it's gonna like fade down just turns into a pint it turns it. into beer right mm -hmm. yeah you definitely have that funkiness to it for sure there's it's not overpowering which isn't it's good yeah 
We're going to save the word funky for our sours later. I want to go with leather, like a, mm. like a, a leather back end. Does that make sense? Okay. Kind of a burnt, um, funk in my mind just associates to kind of that <laughs> people hate this, like wet horse blanket, <laughs> like on okay. well, the sours, like yeah. that's a positive thing if you're talking about certain kinds of beers, but yeah. Um, I, I want to keep that word for something else, but yeah, definitely, definitely powerful. So we also have some notes of coffee. Um, there's that, there's that darkness to it on the bitter end. And so it's like, like after you take a shot of espresso, yeah. that lingering on the back of your, on the back of your tongue, that's what's getting, that's what I'm getting here. Yeah. It, it ha- is reminiscent of having the coffee slightly burnt, but yes. not uh, overly done. Like I don't love Starbucks coffee because it always mm-hmm. tastes burnt to me. Yep, it's un it's under that, um, but it's there. I you're spot on. Yep. Well, I'm having fun so far. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> we're going on. We're going. We're going long here, but um, so let's plow into the next one. What do you think? Yep. So this is uh, one that I know is generally going to be fairly polarizing to uh, yep. different people. Uh, mm-hmm. So we decided to go with kind of a nitro Irish stout here. Uh, so I went with one I actually have never had before uh, because, you know, everybody's probably tried Guinness and you either love it or you think it's motor oil. Uh, yep. Murphy's is another one I actually like better than Guinness. But this is a Breckenridge Brewery's. Irish Nitro Stout. So I was interested so to good. try it out and say, I've never had it, but I'm looking forward to it. What would you bring to this one? I brought a 903 Pretzel Day Stout. So I know my oh, lighting's kind of weird there here. You go. <laughs> um, and it's got Michael Scott. On- productivity is important, but how can I be productive if I have this one little thing in my brain that I cannot get out? And that one little thing is a soft pretzel. So I'm just going to have my soft pretzel. I got to work and I'm gonna be super productive. Look out for me. On the can, that is why I picked it. And I'm seeing on the label that I have like some, it looks like cake. Uh, yeah. I guess cake, uh, <laughs> what a frosting on there. And so I'm super, I'm super curious. I've never had this before. Um, it is 12% ABV. So I'm just gonna take a couple of sips of this. <laughs> So that I can be coherent during the day. I have not read the back of the can, so this is a surprise to me. Um, but whenever you see Michael Scott, you kind of got to pick it up, and we got to go yeah. from there, right? Scranton, yeah. Pennsylvania, so. only about uh, two hours away from me. <gasps> Dude, they have an actual 5K on the route that they did in the show, and they just oh, did really? it. I saw it on Instagram. <laughs> you got to go. I, I go gotta so check bad. that out next time. And people dress up like the characters from uh, the office. So, okay. Awesome. So, fun fact: that hiss that you just heard. If if right. I know right, they have. It's called a. Oh, I want to say a goober, but it's not a goober. It's a. It's the the ball that goes inside yeah. the nitro cans. Guinness a, has it patented. It's not um, a widget. A wi- Maybe it is uh, something, something like, like that. that, right? Okay. It's in the can. Essentially, as soon as you release the pressure, it says, Wah! and it like yeah. expels all the nitrogen into the can so that you get the equivalent of a nitrogen pour. And you're doing it right, right now, where you pour it straight down into the glass. That's how that works. Um, so uh, yeah. you're doing it right. And I want to see, can you show us the glass? Yeah. Is there the nitro pour? Here. It's, going on it didn't have the same cascade that it didn't have the I cascade would, thing going on i thought i was going to say okay but when, when you do that with a actual guinness pint it will it, it's a full like nitrogen pour. so all that all that nitrogen is is just a, a it's a different gas that's ex, uh absorbed into the liquid so normally beer anything carbonated is just co2 nitrogen does not readily absorb into beer and so that's why we have to force it in so it's usually like a um 
70-30 or 80-20 mix carbon dioxide with nitrogen, but that's what the little goober in the gut in the cup does. So, I'm calling it a goober from now it's on. It's a goober. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've cut the can open to show people. I'm like, look, this is all it is. And it's just like, it looks like a big marble uh, yeah, yeah. inside the can. So um, is what it is. Uh, at the brewery level, if you want to serve stuff on nitro, you have to have a nitrogen tank and a CO2 tank or a combo that's a usually an 80-20 mix in the, okay. in the thing. So let's dive right into it. You tell me what you're tasting. Oh, so look, we've got, it's opaque, but like you mentioned earlier, if I look at the very bottom edge of my glass here, I do have that red hue to it. Looking yep. straight through it, I can't look straight through it. I mean, this is just, you're not going to see anything. Yeah. But if you, I don't think you can see it on camera here, but looking into my studio light here, there's definitely that almost syrupy color around the edge yep uh red is very normal um for stouts and that is because of the crystal malts that we use to make it so it there's chocolate malts there's black malts there's patent black malt um crystal 120 and those are all like different variations of the charcoaly that we can get so and they come off as red um on the edge I'm not seeing squat out of this. Uh, <laughs> this is like a pint of darkness. <laughs> so, sure and that's is. not a that is not a slight on 903. I don't know anything about this beer, so we are hunting in the dark uh, on now, this one. You so don't, you don't really have much head at all. No color there. Zero head. I've um, got this uh, nice kind of what you would expect out of an Irish stuff. <laughs> this kind of thin, very creamy looking head up here. Yep. Very common um, for a stout to have kind of a tan head where mm -hmm. in, instead of like perfect white, it's also just kind of bring that color out again, head it, the foam in that is just more beer. So yeah. it makes sense that it would be here. So a tan head on a stout is perfectly normal. That's what I'm seeing on yours. Um, this from a mile away, I can smell it. It smells like salted caramel. Yeah. And it's, it's, Again, it says pretzel day, which makes me smile because I've got another can in my in my walk in that has Stanley on it, and Stanley's the one in the episode that goes down and gets like everything on. It's like the sugar and the like. Give me the works. Um, so this is making it. me happy. Salted coma for days. Um, okay, I I have a feeling I'm really gonna enjoy this. So yeah, that's gonna be one you're gonna go back to after this. I'm going in. I don't know if I can get it again. I hope so. Yeah. Um, the aroma for days. This is this is salted caramel for me. What are you getting on yours? Uh, I'm getting that kind of roasted smell, uh, kind of brown bread. You know, the dark you bread, go. not your typical white bread. Yes. Um, which are kind of smells I would expect out of something like this. I would have been surprised mm -hmm. if it wasn't, but, you know, that's what... That's what's beautiful about craft beer. It is. It's perfect. Yeah, I like it. it. It's actually a little more aromatic than Guinness. Yes, uh, Guinness is. A, a, I, I'm not saying this in, pejoratively. It's a run of the mill. Like it yeah. wants to be level. It wants to be a crowd pleaser, and it is. They know exactly what they're doing. Their recipe is fantastic. Right and. Um, it also tastes different here than it does in Europe. So if you're ever uh, in Europe and you try Guinness yeah. fresh off the pint or fresh off the tap, you're going to be like, oh, oh, that's what it's supposed to taste like. Like, surprise. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, Guinness is a crowd pleaser for a reason exactly like Budweiser, Coors Light, all the all the big beers. And so, I like Guinness, so we're not bad yeah. enough in Guinness. No, I, I like Guinness too. Um, right. It is... It, Folks that do say, oh, it's a like breakfast in a glass, like, mm, no, it's the same exact calorie content and weight as a Budweiser, so yeah. it's really not. It's just it's you're just not used profile. to seeing the darkness in there, and that's, yeah, <laughs> it's all mental. It's all mental. Calorie-wise, it's the same thing. It's not a heavy beer by any means. I agree. This... This, however, yeah. is a heavy beer, and I'm like, whoo! I 
if I had to categorize this, I would I would definitely say Imperial Stout going on. Like I'm obviously from the ABV that I did peak at, it's twelve percent. But just taking a sip, like I can feel the warmth in my mouth. So now we're talking about the the mouthfeel, low carbonation, high viscosity, um, and it's really good. <laughs> so yeah, I'm enjoying this one. Oh, that's good. So I'm getting kind of the same flavor profiles that I smelled. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of a sweetness there coming from mm -hmm. something. I'm not a hundred percent sure what it is, but it's there. That's the that's uh, the malts talking yeah. to you. Yep. Uh, and it's got a nice creaminess to it. So this is a a very smooth tasting, uh, smooth tasting, smooth feeling beer. Yes um yeah this is nice this is pleasant so let's hone in on that the mouthfeel um nitro just if we're thinking about like the actual chemistry of the bubbles in carbonation uh there is such it, it's called carbonic bite and so that's the bubbles that grab your tongue and say yeah. hey there's a little bit of acidity here that's what's happening when for example you drink a coke from mcdonald's versus when you bring a can home it they just taste different yeah. and the reason is because the coke straw at mcdonald's is bigger gauge and you're coating your tongue with it faster than when you're taking a sip from the can so um basically there's just more carbonic bite going on and you're like oh this is great and they do that yeah. so that you drink more of it and sure. you're happier right um <laughs> same thing happens um with that nitro, the bubbles in nitrogen are far smaller and they have a far smaller effect on your tongue than carbon dioxide. So you're still uh, crispy and it's still affecting your senses, but it's not so much. And it gives that like velvety, uh, silky feel that you're experiencing right now. So mine does okay. not have nitro, so I'm not feeling that right now, but... Uh, that's what's happening. So I know that yeah. kind of got a little bit nerdy, but that's why we're here, right? No, I, I like it. And it, it definitely has that coating on the tongue. Uh, like it lingers yeah. on the tongue. Um, this isn't the, the, the phrase I would like to use, but it's almost like when you kind of get that wax on your tongue, it just kind of hangs out around your tongue yep. and you almost, you almost rub it against the roof of your mouth if you want to get it off. Viscous and silky come to mind, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the beer that you're having. But yeah, um, I'm sorry, not viscous, uh, silky or smooth, silky or smooth. Yeah. Viscous is what I'm having right now. This is delightful. And so I'm yeah. not using viscous as a, in a bad way. That's usually how like barley wines are where they're yeah. just like very heavy, 14%, 16%. Um, so it, it depends on the beer. So, okay, folks. This is a good learning point. Um, a stout can have a massive range. If you're looking at a stout or a porter, it can be anything from 4% to 15%. So do not judge a book by by its cover. You just got to try them. Um, that's, that's what I love about the style. Like stout and porter, they kind of go in the same range. We could talk about this for an hour, but... Um, if you see that, don't necessarily make judgment on it. If it does say nitro, it's going to be a silky drink and you're going to have a good time uh, just like Anthony is. Uh, but I have a thick motor oil style stout and it is just as good and exciting to have. So, um, yeah, be ready. Be ready for an adventure. It, and a lot of it also has to do with you know, the balance, right? And this yes. goes for every beer, not just stouts. It goes for IPAs, for the strong house, for everything. Some things are going to be super balanced and they're not mm -hmm. going to be, they might be intense, but in a not oppressive way. And then there's others where it's very, you know, hop forward and it's going to be yep. bitter and it's, or it's going to be very chocolate forward, whatever it might be. You just have to find the ones you like. There, there's so many different styles. Like Ryan said, it could go any direction. You, you have to experiment. You have to try it. Yep, and that's 
kind of the point of why we're doing this, right? Is like, let's put some language behind the flavors that are there. So again, there's no wrong answer. If this beer makes you taste um, like pretzel day, which this does, I'm getting cake frosting and salted caramel out of this. That's awesome. A ton. That's exciting. So uh, let's do it. brewing, right? That is 903 Brewing. I'm a tag him. And uh, 903 Brewers. I've never heard of it. I picked it up at my local bottle shop and I was like, where are they at? Because it, had, it, it has Michael Scott on them. And so I'm super happy. Um, I Oh, Sherman, Texas. There you go. Now we know. Yep. Well, if I had to guess, 903 is probably the area code. Yep. I'm just probably. guessing. I'm just guessing. Okay. Our last one. You ready? I'm ready. What do you got? So Ta-da! I... Ta-da! In the beautiful Ta-da. glass. Oh, my goodness. So, You're so, so... amazing. <laughs> so I've got Line and Kugel's Juicy Peach, and I've got my Teku glass here. The Teku uh, because glass. I, I just had to bring it out. Tell us about the Teku glass. Come on. Oh, no, I got to direct everybody over to the video which will be right up here somewhere Uh of introducing you to the teku glass but all kidding aside the teku glass by some aficionados is the premier glass for all beer drinking you can Mm -hmm. use this for most everything um i'll say i don't love ultra strong beers out of this uh because it does concentrate everything Right into your nose there, and it can be a little overwhelming. You would not that, like the motor oil that I'm drinking in that glass. Yeah, yeah, that's probably too much for the Teku, but these types of beers, these very, what I expect to be fruity, flavorful, bright kind mm-hmm. of beers, that's perfect for this. So what's happening in that glass that makes it perfect? Uh, well, I'm not going to call the glass perfect. I'm no offense to the creators of the glass, but we've got this beautiful angled bowl here, which is going to concentrate everything and then lead it up to the top because you yep. can see these angles here. And then what's different, you know, for somebody looking at this from afar, it might look like a wine glass. You've got this bowed out rim here that actually helps that beer pour out more effortlessly. You don't have to try to tilt it somewhat. Like some wine glasses, you like have a to? Cabernet it, glass. Yep, yep. Correct. It, it's mm-hmm. not bowed in; it's actually bowed out, so it rolls out nicely. But you get some really nice aromas coming up to your nose here. I love it. I love it. Okay, um, pour it. Let's see how that goes. I'm going to show people. This is my uh, fruited kettle sour that I made recently. This is a. Uh, traditional American sour, and I fruited it with actual berries in the fermenter, and it came out fantastically. So what does yes. a kettle sour mean? So a sour beer, in general, just means that there has been some kind of enzymatic activity that makes it sour, and usually that means it is lactobacillus or uh, like a f- a uh, funky strain of yeast that has gone at it. So some sours, they're like traditional. They're in barrels for a year or six months or more. Um, a kettle sour, we allow this to sour for 24 hours, 48 hours, depending okay. on on the time. Lactobacillus will take it down to 3.2, 3.0 pH, and then we bring it up to a boil to kill the lactobacillus. And that's that. And then we ferment it as usual. There are yeast strains now that let us uh, quick sour, so that ferments and sours in the fermenter. Uh, So if somebody says it's a sour beer, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a kettle sour. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a traditional. There's different variations of that. But this particular one is a kettle sour, which means I let it sour for about 30 hours in the kettle at 90 degrees lactobacillus turned all of those proteins into a souring it dropped the ph so um i call this one the uh you uh, if you're familiar with the tart 
it's the berry, um, not Starburst, uh, the, the, the sour Skittles. Mm. That's what this reminds me okay. of. Okay. That's what I was after, which is why I put actual berries into the fermenter and then let that sour out. So, um, that's what we're after. Uh, so you can see you've got a very different color profile than I do. Yes, sir. Very different head profile than I do. And and yeah. again, we're talking similar style beers here. Mm -hmm. um, but again, mine, if you were to pour this next to that Modelo from earlier, I probably couldn't tell you the difference. They look identical. So they, pale straw. Yeah. yeah. Clean. Pale straw. Crystal. Clean. Yep. And that head dissipated as fast as anything else. Um, so, and, and yeah, and mine is kind of murky, uh, actually yeah. not kind of, it's really murky. Um, it is brand new, so it hasn't sat in a keg for six months or whatever, trying to clear up. Um, uh, it will clear up in time, but it'll take a long time. Um, so we got little murky. Uh, I do have lacing on there. Mm -hmm. The head retention on this is actually pretty impressive at, for, it's not really a Berliner Weiss original style it's just a classic sour but it um and then the the yeah the berry expression definitely took over that color so that's what we're looking yeah at. for yours from afar from three thousand miles away it almost has that margarita type look to it oh i can see that all right all right i hear i hear you yeah all right let's hmm Oh, that's oh, I love me a good, good sour, dude. After a porter or the the imperial stout that I was having, yeah. that just like cleans everything out. It's just like whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. Go ahead. You, this, you talk first. This to me just and I'm gonna almost jump straight to impression before mm -hmm. you, the other stuff's there. But this to me, the moment I taste it, screams. Sitting out back on a sunny day and just hanging out, sitting on the beach. These, this is a crush all yes. day type beer. Um, but backing up the aroma, a little bit of peach. Honestly, not as strong as I would have mm -hmm. expected, which is fine. But flavor, the peach is there, but in a super considerate way. It's not hitting you over the head yeah. and saying, this is peach, it's tart, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's a very smooth peach, sweet honey type flavor just kind of seeping in there. It's not beating you up. So you That's can drink this hear. over yeah. and over again. Mm -hmm. Because there, and I've yeah. had sours where I'm like, all right, one, and I'm going to be sitting here like, oh, this fucking hurts yes <laughs> it's it's the like acid reflux waiting to happen yeah. because yeah it, and that's what it tastes like going down sometimes you're just yeah. like <laughs> this is not that okay no um i love i i love the way that you described that that's perfect so um i'm not, learning i'm learning not uh overwhelming on the flavor side like because you want the tartness to come through when i when i tell people Hey, try this sour. I want them to equate it to the um like Starbursts or like the yeah. like a candy that they are already familiar with. And I'm like, dude, imagine this in a candy. Like you would love it. That's... Do you guys have water ice out there? You might call it Italian ice. No, we have yeah, I didn't think so. We have shaved uh, ice, Hawaiian shaved ice. ice. Hawaiian ice yeah, yeah. is a big thing, so, yeah. So... Same yeah. thing. So we have a chain out here called Rita's, which is okay. you know, big on the Oh, yeah. Coast. Yeah, yeah. We got Rita's. Yeah. Oh, you have Rita's? Nice. I do that have a Rita's. Exist. That, yeah. that didn't exist out there for a long time. Okay. But I, maybe this, it's the same franchise. I don't know. Maybe it's just a I, random I, I Rita's that I happen to have here in Fresno. Gr <laughs> yeah. Green and white logo with red lettering. Anyway, mm -hmm. the, this, would rem this reminds me of what Rita's water ice is, where it's this smooth peach. It's not just bashing you over the head. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the sours are a platform for other flavor. So you don't want to drink a sour beer just naturally. A Berliner Weiss or a Goza without an additional flavor is not going to be great. Um, 
they're usually hinging on the adjunct that you put into them. So if it's kiwi okay. or peach or mixed berries or something like that, that's what like you're trying to showcase. The sourness is just kind of giving you like a baseline um, tartness level on the back of your mouth that's happy, but it allows that expression to show up. And so... For in my case, this was physically five pounds of mixed berries that I got from Costco, and I just mooshed them up in the bag and I put them into the fermenter and I let them sit for three days, right? Like, and that's that's how I imparted the flavor into it. Um, other sours, I've had killer sours from local breweries, which which are like kiwi or um, pineapple is a common one, mango is a common one. Uh, dark cherries, things like that. And it's just, it's a perfect blank canvas on the sour side to give expression to the brewer's choice. And so this particular one is mixed berries, but like you're saying, like it just, it cleared out my palate from everything that we've had yeah. before. The salted caramel uh, is completely gone. And now I'm just enjoying this mixed berries and it's like, it's an absolute delight. 4.3%, 4.5% ABV, so I could drink this all afternoon long, and I'm more hydrated than I was before. <laughs> yeah, and I would say, uh, you know, I don't, there's a lot of writing on this, Ken, for me to figure out. 4.4. Uh, <laughs> 4. 4. 4. So, there you, you go. Know, about the same. They're uh, usually would, pretty low ABV, yeah. I would say if you're somebody who, you know, likes seltzers, the, you know, the White Claws, the Trulies, something like that, or kind of that wine spritzer, this is kind of the route you'd go yep. if you were at a brewery and didn't have those available to you. This is a good place to start and to get yourself into the craft beer world. Dude, the heartbreak. My wife is married to a brewer. She doesn't like beer, but she'll drink this. My fiance so, doesn't like beer either. It is what it is. Like, I, I gave her a sip of this literally yesterday, and she's like, oh. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm like, oh, all right, all right. So you do like beer, right? She's like, no. <laughs> yeah. there, there's your marketing ploy. I made a non-beer light beer. I made a, a like non-beer beer approachable. Yeah. Yeah. You no, the, that, these... you should call that conversion or something. Like that. <laughs> yes, uh, I like it. I like it. So the, the exact same method with the berries. I use this on my um, hard berry cider. So I'll make a okay. cider and I dry hop it with the quote unquote dry hop it with the exact same berry regime and it comes out the same color. Um, but yeah, she, no, she dug it. She dug it. So awesome. it's a win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are, I mean, like that's five super different styles of beer. Uh, super different. They're, they're super different. different. There's, yeah. there's five pretty different styles of beer. Something that, I think there's something there for everyone, or at mm -hmm. least hopefully with Ryan's expertise and knowledge here, you can appreciate certain aspects of it a little bit more and not just go with the, that's bad. This is good. <laughs> um, you know, if we're going to go to the, uh, the office reference, Andy trying to be a food critic there, that yep. beer is bad. That beer is bad. Yeah. yeah. No, there, dude, nothing drives me more crazy than like, untapped reviews where it's just like i'm a like light lager lover and this ipa is terrible it's like well, yeah. of course it's terrible but you don't like, like just it. yeah learn to appreciate it for what it is for what the brewer intended it to be and go from there yeah. yeah and with all that being said i think both of us have the same message of experiment try different things and yep support your local craft breweries or craft breweries anywhere i mean there we've got thousands of them now yes um and if you're the you know macro beer lover cool that's fine step yep. out once in a while and try one of anybody and just see or what you like ask ask the beer tender say hey normally i'm a uh corona guy ask them what they have maybe they have something on tap that's similar or it's a you know a mexican lager or they've got some kind of pilsner or something that you can try and you may discover that you're going to love it. Um, that's the gateway. And that, like, I yeah. was forced into it with being stuck at a family occasion with an arrogant bastard. But um, 
I I wouldn't have even thought of going out and trying something different because I was like, I, I didn't even think about it. But then my eyes were opened and now it's... <laughs> can't, can't really go back I now, can't, can you? I can't, undo, I can't unopen that package. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. All right, so Ryan, this has been awesome. Before we call it a night, closing thoughts for our viewers, for me, for anyone, what do you want to leave them with? A parting note. Um, give craft beer a try if you haven't yet. So there's so many styles. Again, I say that it is more nuanced and more um, finesse than uh, wine could ever be. There's so many more variables that we can do. So just give it a try. If you're like, I'm just not a hoppy beer guy, like, hey, dude, whatever. There's so many styles that are not super hoppy. And I just, um, I, I cannot tell you how much joy there is in discovering these new styles. Uh, it's just worth trying. So go out there and and even if it's just a restaurant, um, give whatever the local craft beer uh, industry has to offer a try and see you might like their pilsners you might like their ipas you might like their stouts um they're all different styles the only way to build that repertoire of understanding what things taste like in your mind is by trying them so get out there and try love it awesome yep. well everybody that's ryan hansen from big pop brewing ryan how does everybody find you at Big Pop Brewing on Instagram or BigPopBrewing.com. That's my uh, consulting uh, homepage, and that's what I do. I teach breweries how to make better beer. Awesome. And I'm Anthony Cos from Cazotto Photo. Uh, if you're a brewery who needs photography, look me up or on Instagram and YouTube as All Things Beer. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was a lot of fun. I've got a bunch of half beers to finish here. <laughs> Same. Yep. <laughs> probably go to sleep. So uh, thank you so much. I hope everybody has an awesome night and we look forward to seeing you again. We'll do something like this again soon. Later, dude. Cheers, everyone.